Hey everyone, and welcome to the podcast. I'm your host, retired Marine Corps Lieutenant Colonel Dave Armstrong, and this podcast is focused on the goal of translating the stories and experiences of seasoned military leaders into moments in leadership, which are accessible to everyone. My goal is to provide the best content in a medium that can be consumed and used in any listening, leadership development, or learning environment. If you enjoy this podcast, I've created two membership programs that let you donate to help offset my costs associated with creating quality episodes. One is a simple donation equivalent to buying me a beer. If you want to take your knowledge of this space to the next level, the Hot Wash donation level will bring you early release access to future interviews, as well as special episodes with far more in-depth content in the form of panel discussions with both company grade officers and NCOs of the previous episodes and also on current leadership challenges and observations. Regardless of what level you choose to support at, it will all go towards keeping the project's long-form guest interviews free for all emerging leaders. And if you want to learn more now, go take a look at the link in the show notes and see how you can support the project. Regardless of what level you choose to support, it will all go towards keeping the project's primary episodes of long-form guest interviews free for all emerging leaders to benefit from. Finally, a thanks to my most recent Patreon subscribers, and I'm sorry if I screw up any pronunciation here, Kenneth Shanks, Oliver Mozoyo, Lieutenant Colonel Paratet from HMLA 267, Ethan Henderson, Philippe Lemus, Sean O'Grady, Lieutenant General Dave Bellin, Zachary Stiller, Renee Hill, Zach Matart, Shannon Harris, and Alexander Grandprey. Now, before I get going on this episode of the podcast, I want to share a quick story with you all. I was recently invited to be the guest of honor at a Marine Corps birthday ball out for the stingers of HMLA 267. Now, I know September 1st is an odd time of the year to have a ball, but due to some operational commitments, they'll be taking the squadron on three different adventures this fall, and they wanted to celebrate the birthday before they left. Now, I have to tell you that I've been going to birthday balls for over 30 years now, and I've seen guests of honors who were recipients of the Medal of Honor, who fought throughout the Pacific in World War II, and also veterans of the Chosen Reservoir. So being asked to be a guest of honor was an extreme honor, to say the least. I got there a day early and got a tour of their spaces. I met the Marines. I crawled around on some helicopters, and I even tried my hand at trying to fly the new Cobra in a flight simulator. They were smart enough not to put me on an actual bird. Although, if I were asked back by an HMLA, I'd probably angle for that. Or, of course, if an F-18 squadron needed a uh, guest of honor and was willing to do a backseat ride, I'd agree to that. Okay, I digress. You guys see where I'm going. But anyway, I can tell you that those few hours brought me a whole different level of admiration of the skills that it takes to not only fly an aircraft like that, but to maintain it as well. And the men and women that I met of that helicopter squadron were nothing short of amazing. So Semper Fi Stingers, every single one of you are badass. Thanks for making me feel like one of your family. I'll serve with you anytime, anywhere. Ra. Okay, anyway, uh, the commanding officer held a quick officer's call for the pilots of his squadron, and I got to speak with them in a very informal social setting. I learned from a lot of questions that they asked, and those questions gave me some ideas for conversations that we're going to have in upcoming Hot Wash episodes. But here's what I'm really getting at. Over the past 60 days, I've had an opportunity to observe battalion and squadron level leaders doing their jobs. I saw it out at ITX in 29 Palms, and I saw it recently at HMLA 267. Now, look, I, I don't mean to offend any of my previous battalion commanders. I'm, I'm here to tell everyone listening that today's current battalion level commanders are operating and leading at a level that is so vastly superior to the level in which command was being conducted when I was a company grade officer. And I'm really excited to see that. And again, that's not to say the battalion commanders that I had when I was younger were bad. I'm just saying they're much better now, which is exactly the way everybody should want it to be, right? It's that old, leave it better than you found it saying. But look, I'm telling you that these battalion commanders are better now than they were 20 or 30 years ago. And I think they realize that the Marines are willing to bust their asses and fight for leaders and units that care about them. And something in my gut tells me that there is a renaissance going on in the Marine Corps where it is turning into a real people business in a way that I don't think has ever existed before. And I find that really encouraging. So on to today's episode, which features a guest who needs absolutely no introduction, Major General Dale Alford, who recently retired from the Marine Corps, was on a podcast earlier this spring. And when we spoke as a follow-up, I offered to have him come on and do a quick one-hour episode right as he was retiring. And he was gracious enough to say yes and dedicate a Sunday afternoon to getting it done before he PCS back down to Georgia that very day. So with that, welcome back, Major General Dale Alford. Also the first person to ever come on twice onto the podcast. So 
thank you very much for taking some time to do that. Thanks for having me back. So I guess it's worth mentioning to everybody that you're retiring and you're standing in an empty house with nothing in it and getting ready to PCS back down to Georgia. Yeah, tomorrow. Tomorrow's my fun. I go on uh, terminal leave tomorrow. That's great. When is the actual last day? When do you, and, and when will be your retirement and where will it be? Yeah, 30 September. Okay. Last day in the Marine Corps. Uh, 24 September, Saturday, 24 September down in Alpharetta, Georgia. Oh, you're actually going to do it down in Georgia. That's great. My hometown. Who's coming down to do it? Sparky Renforth, General, and uh, Dave Furness. General Dave Furness are both kind of a dual retirement. Great. Two fantastic Marines. I, I was just recently in 29 Palms so to watch the ITX. I didn't get a chance to see uh, Major General Renforth because uh, I guess he had just had some shoulder surgery or something. So He did. Yeah. 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 He's, he's in recovery. He's been, it's been a couple of weeks, but yeah, it's going to take a a few months to get where he gets swing the golf club. More. <laughs> Good for him. I decided to start off by asking you what could be a kind of a hard question to answer for someone like you that may be reluctant to want to answer honestly. So your original episode with me in Moments of Leadership has more total downloads in the first 30 days of being you know, a live episode than any other episode I have. It's also one of most heavily commented on in the public postings and then even just direct messages to me from all Marines of all different ranks who have this really deep admiration for you. So this is why I think the question may be hard for you, because I know good leaders are generally really humble and quick to shift attention away from themselves. So as you look back on your career and over all the commands that you've held, what personality or leadership trait do you think is most attributable to you being so revered by everybody? I I say this a lot, I guess, when I when I talk about leadership is, you know, the ability to touch a Marine soul. And how do you do that? And you do it in multiple ways, but it's really showing that you care about them and their family. Um, spending a lot of time. I talked about that earlier, I think. You did. In the last podcast, the amount of time it takes to, to really be, truly be a good leader takes away from your family to do it right when you're in command. And I've ha- had the uh, privilege of, of being in command an awful lot during my 34 years. Just the, um, the ability to, to, to really show you care, I guess is what that is. And I and I try awful hard, particularly, you know, you, you got the, a particular group that surrounds you, you know, and the higher rank you go, your troops become different people. You know, this last job, I had 17 colonel commanders. So, you know, that's and then you have to, your small command group around you. And that's really about all you can touch. But to truly show those 17 colonels that I care about them and that uh, that I gave them the range to, to command their unit the way they saw fit. If they were the experts, that's why they were picked. I, I would say, you know, I, I would be arrogant if I told, you know, Joe Broom out at 29 Palms that runs com, our comm school, comm elect school, how to train Marines to communicate, right? Or John Medeiros, who, who does our amphibious assault school. Now, he's the expert. And I really gave them the range to, to command their school how they saw fit and to train them our future leaders, our future Marines, and the, and the MOS is the way they saw fit. Does that make sense, I guess? It, you know? it does. Yes, sir. And I'll tell you, if there's, it would be hard for me to give you a retirement gift, but here's, I'll try. I should cut and paste every single comment and email and message that I've received about your episode and, and how much people love and respect you as a, as a leader. It mean, means a lot. Yeah. Well, thank you. Passing that along to you is is my retirement gift. I just I was constantly replying to people saying, I'm gonna to try to get him back on. I'm gonna to try to get him back on. So, you know, on behalf of all the Marines whose souls you have touched, and I've only known you for a very short period of time, you've touched mine as well just through getting to know you. Congratulations on a fantastic career and fair winds and following season, all of those things that we say to people. But uh, I have a funny feeling that we haven't seen or heard of the last of you. And hopefully and, and I'll get to a question about what your plans are next, but the next question I came up with was you've essentially successfully retired, right? Going on terminal leave. But when you look back on the last 12 months, right? So just the last 12 months that you had in uniform, what advice do you have for leaders who are themselves a year away from getting out? Mm, yeah. I actually didn't know I was retiring until 89 days ago. So originally I was going to do until next June, but um, had an opportunity, uh, <sighs> The management of generals, you know, we can only have 62 in the Marine Corps and so forth. And, and I'd, I'd been asking to, to retire for a couple of years off and on here. And I was helped, you know, it takes, they recommend it takes, uh, you know, nine months to do all your 
all your medical and all your VA and all the things you're doing. I, and I did it in uh, under 90 days, but I had help. The ACMAC, uh, General Eric Smith, uh, got involved and made sure that I, that I got uh, moved through pretty quickly, particularly to get your uh, your final physical and all that stuff and get a VSO, a, a veteran service officer. I took the classes uh, a year and a half ago when I was going to retire last year. The executive tap class mm-hmm. is good, I guess. Uh, also, just mentally, you know, with doing 34, you know, 37 total years in Marine Corps, I enlisted in 85 and uh, went active duty as an officer in 88. So it's been 34 active. Just in your mind, coming to grips with a, that this is it, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, I got to imagine the mental. The mental transition. And I, yeah. And I'm sure I'm not, haven't gone through all of it yet. Right. I haven't. Yeah. And I, I just literally, I had lunch yesterday with General Scotty Miller, who's been retired about a year. He okay. went on terminal last, he came home from Afghanistan and uh, went on terminal leave pretty quick after that. And he was talking to me about, you know, it really doesn't hit you until, you know, two or three months in. So it was a good, good session with him yesterday. He's a, he's a, one of the greatest uh, leaders I've ever served with. Yeah, I'm glad he. I'm glad he was able to give you some advice and share his experience yeah. with you. He really hadn't done a whole lot of work yet. He's just now starting to think about you know doing some work. You know, he's been basically retired almost a year. It's funny because somebody asked me to talk to a group of colonels. They were so I don't think it was the executive level, but whatever whatever the colonels and the senior senior sergeant majors go through. I went to a tap. Tamp, whatever they're called now. And some of the other people on the panel were saying, you know, here's what you can do. And a lot of defense contractors and people who stay attached to the government. And it finally came to, down to me. And, and I just said, geez, how many people in the group here aren't going to do anything? Just retire. And a third of the hands went up. And most of them were saying, like, I'm just going to take a gap year, like kids do between coll- uh, high school and college. So I'm just going to relax for a year. It's probably a lot of benefit to that. Yeah, I've, I've decided I'm going to wait till, till January, at least. That's good. So if you didn't have the luxury of General Smith helping push it through all, talk to a lieutenant colonel or a gunny who's at 20 and getting out. Are there, are there things that just looking back over the past 12 months, be like, you know, I, I probably should have spent some more time on X, Y, Z. Yeah. You know, besides all the medical stuff and making sure you get that done right. Spending time with people who really matter to you too, that throughout your career, that you may reconnect with all those people who who got you to where you were. That advice was given to me by uh, General Paul Lefevre. He's been retired about seven years now, I think. When he found out that I was retiring back in May, he called me. I was on really I was on a drive to Alpharetta to Atlanta for Memorial Day weekend, and he called. We talked for two or three hours that that day in the car you know, while driving down. That was his biggest advice is, is over the next three months. Because he said he didn't do that. He worked up until the last minute. Right. right? And, and that's just the way he is, right? But he's like, if he had to do it over again, he would spend more time with, with reconnecting with those people who mattered and got you to where you were. And, uh, and I tried to do that over the last three months with, at times. So. Who are three of the people that you've reconnected over the past three months that you, hadn't, that you didn't keep in touch with on a daily basis? Who are some of your big aha Really glad I saw that guy. Yeah, Rory Mortensen, um, who was my battalion commander, and I was his XO for the March to Baghdad. So we've we've talked a few times, and he came to the change of command uh, last week. Talked with uh, Colonel Steve Davis, who was my okay. regimental commander when I had three six in Iraq. General Favor is is one as a mentor of mine, and then just uh, you know some of the, the younger Marines and all my company commanders that that were with me in three six. I've re talked to all of those guys. Most of they're all coming to the to the retirement. You know, just as I was going through my phone to send out invitations to the to the retirement, you know, a lot of them I, I, I sent texts to guys that I hadn't talked to in a long time. You know, it's kind of strolling through memory lane is you know, time we finished, we sent out over five hundred invitations. So and we've gotten like four hundred and thirty five yeses. So it's gonna be a big party. <laughs> I guess, guess you better get the house ready. We rented a bar right by our house. So <laughs> that's perfect. So next question in keeping in the theme of looking back over your career, not asking you what you would have as a do over, but are there any tours that you would have liked to have tried that, you know, you just couldn't cause you can't do everything in 36 years. 
if you look back, say like, I would have really liked to have done X, Y, Z. Is there, does anything come to mind? Yeah. Second Marine Division. <laughs> yeah. That didn't work out. I prepared my entire life to command Second Marine Division. It went in the cards. Uh, I was originally supposed to take six Marine Regiment, you know, because I was six Marine guy. General Conway changed my orders to the basic school. Oh, I remember you telling that story. Mm-hmm. About six weeks before I was taking command of six Marines, basic school, you know, one command, real honor to do it, right? Uh, story, part of our Corps. But I was commanding six Marines, for God's sake. Right, right. right. <laughs> and going back to Afghanistan with that regiment. So, uh, and I had just gotten back from Afghanistan, been there 14 months. So that was part of the calculation. Yeah. Giving me time to cool my heels, I guess. How about back in your career? Maybe think back to your captain time. Was there something you would have liked to have done as a B billet or maybe as a major time? Any any things that you're like, geez, I would have liked to have been force recon or All right. Now I was on a med float and uh my third deployment as a lieutenant I had the LAR debt with uh with two four on the two four mu. And I wanted to go to TBS to, to you know and have a chance to be an instructor at IOC. Hmm. And I got orders to Paris Island. And I was pissed. Right? <laughs> I was going to get out and thought, hell with this, right? One of the best tours. You know, I got to be, I did one cycle as a series commander and did six as a company commander. So I was able to, you know, be a company commander, you know, and have a first sergeant, be in charge of officers, you know, your series commanders, have staff and COs before I went to the fleet to be a company commander. There, there's pros and cons to each one of the B billets. Right. You know, going to TBS and then going over to IOC, you stay really tactically focused and, and, and proficient in tactics, but you don't get the leadership that you get at Paris Island. Right. But at Paris Island, you don't get the tactics that you get, right? So there's there's pros and cons. But, you know, each one of the places, I mean, I went, to, I, I tell you what, I, I've been to combat eight times, but I got PTSD from three years on recruiting duty, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> on recruiting duty, not the drill field. Yes, Nashville, Nashville, Tennessee. So when I was a major, I, I got picked, and I was the opso of, of, of 3-8, getting ready to go on a med float as the opso, and got picked for recruiting and, and didn't get to go. Bill Journey went as the, as the uh, opso of that battalion, and they did the Kosovo operation. But I tell you what, those three years on recruiting duty will be with me for the rest of my life. And the people and the amount of – Marines that are coming to my retirement from those three years is significant. There's probably 15, 20 of those recruiters coming to that I've stayed in touch with over the years. Okay, sir. So let me dig in on that a little bit because they're the biggest audiences I have. I, I have a big enlisted audience and a big captain audience. So talk to the captains real quick who are getting their orders and they're getting sent to recruiting duty or the drill field and they are pissed. Because, right, I mean, I don't know a whole lot of captains who put their hand up in the air and say, I, I want to go on recruiting duty. I think everybody gets voluntold to do that. So talk to them. And what are the three greatest things about the drill field? And what are the three greatest things about recruiting that they may be overlooking because they're just seeing red right now? Right. For the drill field, uh, you, you get a chance to lead staff and CEOs and, and officers, you know, being a series commander, but more importantly, a company commander. And then I was at the Titan three before. I was a battalion three for three eight, right? So I got, uh, so I was a company commander battalion three, went to AWS, and then company commander battalion three for three eight. So the drill field helped me uh, prepare for that in the fleet, you know, doing it in a B billet before you went to do it in the fleet. Also, the, the nostalgia of Paris Island, there's not, you know, that's, that's really, you know, Paris Island, San Diego, and here at Quantico is where we make Marines. And to be a part of that is, is special. Uh, if you go into recruiting duty on a, on your first B billet as a captain, I just had dinner with uh, Rob Hancock, who was my XO in Nashville. He's Colonel now, Colonel Rob Hancock, commanding the headquarters battalion out, out at San Diego. Being an OPSO of a recruiting station is one of the hardest jobs in the Marine Corps. We started making warrant officers, 8412s who were gunnery sergeants, so we turned it made them warrant officers to be opsos of stations. So we just don't make enough. We don't make 48 of them. We don't have 48 enough to, for every station to have one. That's a really tough job. And I'm not going to sugarcoat it at all. Yeah. Uh, it's one of the toughest jobs in the Marine Corps, being an opso of an RS. I mean, it's, it's lights to lights. It's, you work Saturdays. You're paying attention on Sunday night to make sure your shippers get to, get to the map Sunday night for the Monday morning shipping. I mean, oh, it's, it's seven days a week. It's a hard job. Being an OSO is a little more rewarding, you know, it's not, not quite as, 
But I tell you, Oso still have to, you know, they're, they're still writing 30, 35 contracts a year. Right. You know, if you're if you're a recruiter on the bag and you write 30 or 35 contracts, you're you're a meritorious promotion material. Right. So you're you're over two a month, right? You're writing three a month at 36, right? So that's a lot, particularly now. We were back to we're back to the late nineties out there. Yeah. It's it's just tough sledding right now. I was talking to somebody whose son is in, in Oso right now just just earlier this weekend and he said you know my son is just stressing out over the fact that by the end of the month he has to sign up a, somebody who's going to be a lawyer and i live in a town where there's not lawyers he's stressed out over that yes yeah, right. so the, the osos are yeah yeah you get particular missions uh, recruiting duty for a young sergeant staff sergeant also for three out of four marines that go on recruiting duty they have to use systematic recruit to survive it works, but it requires a lot of work. That one out of four is a natural. He can sell Eskimo ice, right? He, I mean, he just, they, you, you see it too. Right. A Marine who's got it, right? You just leave them alone because you don't even worry about the prospecting because they're just writing contracts because they're charismatic and they can, they can talk, talk to people. And people like them and want to be like them, so they join the Marine Corps. So a lot of times you... A young man or woman will join the Marine Corps because of the recruiter, because they want to be like them. Uh, and then when you get to the drill field, you know, you want to be like your drill instructor. Right. Yeah, every, everybody remembers their, their people that were their drill instructors or their platoon commanders or series commanders. I'll never forget yeah. mine. So that was really my only two B billets. I did three years at Paris Island and three years in RS Nashville. I did one year as a, as a fac ad at, at Command and Staff, which was a fun year after a war college, but that's really about it for me. After watching thousands of emerging leaders over your career, what would you say are some of the classic decisive points of their careers and what decisions lead to success? And frankly, what decisions lead to struggle? You know, for me, uh, the reason I became a general was because uh, of Al Kaim three, six, and I made a, 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 decision that we were going into that city and I didn't give a shit what it took. We were going to take it and we were going to stay because nobody else had done that at the time. And, and that turned the tide and that began the awakening in the fall of 05. Even Satara called it the little awakening that was happening in, in 05 before the big awakening in 07. And it was the decision to, to, because I had studied counterinsurgency, and I had not done it right in Afghanistan the year before. We would go into villages, do sweeps, and then leave. We didn't have the ability to stay, but I, I had the ability to, to take ground and stay, and that was a decisive decision uh, that led to being very successful, and then the rest of my career kind of fed off of that. As a company commander, making some pretty bold decisions on, on, on ranges, Mm -hmm. Doing some, some live fire training uh, that other people weren't doing. Uh, me and Dave Furness uh, ran a range in Okinawa together. He started it, and then I, I uh, followed up. We we were there together for a while and and were training together. I got the Leftwich Trophy that year, and much of my write up is talking about bold live fire training that was was being done along with Liberia. Liberia was in there too. Yeah, we didn't get a chance to talk about Liberia in your last episode. You want to take a few minutes and talk about that? I, I know that Damien O'Connell talked yeah. a lot about that in his podcast. Yeah, it's just, uh, you know, we went in there on a single ship, special purpose MAGCAF 8, two rifle companies, and two thirds of weapons company of, of 3-8. Colonel Favor, battalion commander, and a very small regimental staff, which was uh, Colonel Tony Corwin was the regimental commander. And we took one ship over. Ponce with four 46 helicopters on it. And we, we essentially just, and we relieved two, two that, were, that went in there off the Mew and originally secured both the U.S. Embassy and the British Embassy that was next door. And then Baxter stayed. But what was happening at the time in summer of 96 was a complete destruction, a civil war going on. They were destroying the city and destroying each other. And we sat there and watched it. It's one of the most brutal things I've ever seen. There were dead bodies in the streets every single morning. 
from firefights right out in front of the, the embassy and, and hacking each other up. I mean, it was uh, until you see a real civil war. And we saw one with the Sunni and Shias, but nothing compared to what was happening in Monrovia, Liberia in, in the summer of 96. It was, it was, I will never forget that. And that was your, that was your company command. Yeah, I was, I was company commander. I took, I took command. I actually flew over with, with Colonel, Colonel Favor. I can't, they pulled me out of AWS early. Okay. I didn't graduate wait, with, with the class. I, I got pulled out a couple of weeks early. We flew over and then the ship where the rest of the Marines came over and the XO that was going to be the battalion XO, he had Kilo come. So we did a change of command on the fantail of the Ponce, locked and loaded, got onto a 46 and flew into the embassy and took, took over oh, wow. from, uh, from Jeff Kinney. Was Where, the company, the company. Oh yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Jeff Kenny was one of your, um, IOC TBS tactics groups buddies. Was Isn't that? Yeah, but he's a, he's a year so ahead of me. Okay. He, he's with, he was with Furness. Yeah, so that's right. I didn't go to, remember I didn't teach at I, IOC. Yeah. Okay. And then, you know, Jeff went back as a Lieutenant Colonel and was the director. Of IOC. Yep. Okay. Lieutenant, yeah. Went back. Yeah. I still, I talked to Jeff not too long ago and, um, he's coming to the retirement. So. He's retired too, right? Yeah, I yeah he's been retired a few years. Yeah. Right. I hear his name from time to time through uh, Patrick or uh, through uh, Mike McNamara. Yeah, he does. The, he he's on All, All Marine Radio. Yeah, yeah, right. Exactly. Which which yeah, they've got to get back to recording. I think they're taking a break or something. Maybe taking summer vacation. But I, I miss I miss their commentary on things. But yeah, what was what was that like for him? Saying, "Geez, I'm I'm giving up command right when you guys are flying into this combat zone." Yeah, that, that was um, what was his name. And he became our EXO, Battalion EXO. And then he, he got in trouble over in Okinawa the next year and was sent home. Uh, that's when Mike Killian became the EXO and I became the three. I had just got promoted to majors and I became the three of the battalion. Yeah, that was in 97. And then that's when I was the three of the battalion going to go back on a med float and I, I got picked for recruit duty. Okay. In, in the spring. So when you got on the Ponce, that, that's an L, that was an LPD? That was an Austin class LPD? LPD. Okay. Yep. Yeah. And, and we were hot racking. So two full rifle companies, two thirds of a weapons company and, and two small headquarters all on one sh- and four helicopters. all on Okay. One so ship. to be clear, this was not a Mew and you, yeah. you did split Mew ops. This, they, no, we were special purpose Mac that we went to relieve oh, the Mew. So the Mew was in okay, there. So I, yeah. Let me ask you a couple of questions about that, because I think this could be really constructive to leaders who are out there right now who are thinking we're, we're not in combat anymore. You know, there's, we missed that. We missed it. So they just threw together a unit, put it on a ship and sent it over. No warning, no workup, nothing. Did I get that right? Yes. We were getting ready. When I got there, three, eight was scheduled to do a UDP and we did a UDP the next June. So we were, and available, they had just got back off of a Mew float uh, about a few months earlier, six months. They, they did the, that was the Mew that did the O'Grady rescue. Right. Okay. That was the battalion, 3-8. And that, so the next deployment was scheduled to be a UDP, which was a year away. So we were the, an available battalion, you know, and a regimental headquarters. I and mean, it was special purpose, so, Mac 8, that went. To so them. can you rewind to the day that somebody called the formation and said, hey, get your shit ready. We're going to this place unexpectedly and we're getting on this ship, you know, like, cause Muse work up for a year. So everybody knows what was that like? Well, for me, I was in AWS. So I literally packed my stuff, drove to Camp Lejeune, checked in to, to general Colonel of favors office. And we flew out. So, so you're to- sitting in class in AWS and some major comes in and says, Alfred, come here. Yeah. <laughs> I was already scheduled. Me and Bill journey were already scheduled to go to okay. three, eight. But they needed a company commander. They were they were short. So, you know, and Colonel Lefevre had been a fac at okay. AWS at AWS. So I guess he called up there, talked to to Colonel Jones, Little Jones, T. S. Jones, and yeah, I don't really remember the sequence, but I remember I got to Lejeune, checked in, and within a few days I was on a C one thirty flying to wow. Sierra Leone, and the Mew came up with fifty threes and picked us up and brought us out to the ships and then we went into the and so the first time you ever stood in front of your company that you were going to take into combat was on the fantail of the ponce and yes 
Yes. Yes. Wow. Yep. Do you have some memories about that or any, anything worth passing yeah, on? I had, I had no lieutenant. I had one lieutenant, Billy Ray Moore, was the XO, no, and Vaughn Ward. And then I had two lieutenants. And then about a week or two later, uh, they flew in three lieutenants right out of IOC. And Paul Morita, who's got a mew right now, huh. is out on a mew right now. Colonel Paul Morita was one of those lieutenants. And I remember they fly into the embassy. I have them right there. I hand them all ammo, you know, full six magazines. And I was like, there's your platoon. Wow. Go to it. What yeah. an incredible way to check into a platoon. That's, yeah. But I, I guess the point that I'm trying to make there or I'm trying to emphasize is that for people listening, you just never know what you don't know. And you could be thinking that you're going to Okinawa one day and you're not. Every single rank. So as a, as a second lieutenant in March of 89, I check into 3-6. And nobody wanted to go to 6 Marines. Everybody wanted to go to 8 Marines because they were doing the Mews. Within six months, I was in Panama. With it. Three, two months after that, I was in combat for just cause as a second lieutenant. Got home, supposed to do a UDP a year, and Desert Storm kicks off. And first of December, I deployed for Desert Storm of 90. Desert Shield, Desert right. Storm. Came home in May and then um, went on a med float immediately. I was, I was home five months and got a, got a an LAV platoon and, re- and deployed. So boom, 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 back to back to back deployments. Go to Paris Island three years, go to school for a year, end up at 3-8 and in Liberia as, as a captain. And then as a major, I, you know, I was sitting in class when 9-11 happened at, at command and staff here and had a SAW, you know, where you fill out to go to SAW, the application to go to uh, School of Advanced Warfighting. I tore that son of a bitch up and I said, I am going to the fleet. So there's going to be a real war. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I get to the, get to the fleet and I looked at, you know, in 2-8, I'm the XO for Mortenson. I'm like, we're going, right? But we were scheduled to go to CACS. I'd never, here's another thing. I had never been to CACS. That was the third time I was scheduled for CACS and I never went. I always went to combat instead. Wow. No kidding. Yeah. Right. So first time I ever went to 29 Palms, I was the OPSO of six Marines. After the march to Baghdad. That's crazy. First time. Yeah. Because we're generally this, the same. I mean, I was commissioned in 90, so I'm going to lump us in together as coming on active duty around the same time. To people who are on active duty now and don't understand the CAC cycle, I, I'm going to put what Major General Alfred just said into perspective, which is by the time I was finishing up my initial tour in an artillery battalion as a lieutenant, I had already done three CACs. So for you to have not had done, that's... That is it. That that's an incredibly rare statistic, and uh, yeah, that, that's I, hard to believe. So that was the fourth time, actually. I, yeah, three. I was supposed to go with three six, and we went to Panama instead. We were going to go the next year, and I went to Desert Storm instead. And then the next year, I was on a, a Mew. Mews didn't go to Caxton back then. Right. And then I I was going to be originally I was going to be I, I was going to be the weapons company commander for three eight. But I got switched to Kilo for, because of Liberia. And we were scheduled to go to Cax at the end of that summer. And we didn't because we went to Liberia instead. And then 2-8 was supposed to go to Cax the winter of 2002-2003. And instead, we went to the March Up. So that was the fourth time. And, I, and the first time I ever went to 29 Palms with a unit was I was a lieutenant colonel, the OPSO of 6th Marine Regiment. Yep. And, and I came home from that and took command of 3-6. Wow. That's an incredible story. And, and I'll tell anybody who's listening, uh, if, if they're interested, uh, Damien O'Connell has a great podcast. He's, he told me through text message that he's taking a break from it for a little while, but it's called Controversy and Clarity, and you can find it on all the major players. But Major General Alford was a guest on one of his episodes and for two hours talked about his career. And there's a lot of information in there on on the Liberia operation. And if you have any, any interest in learning more about General Alford's experience there, definitely go check that episode out. And that whole podcast series is pretty good. Sir, I don't, I don't know if you get a whole lot of feedback on your episode there, but it was that was really good too. I've listened to it twice. So a question that people have been wanting me to ask, not just you, but in general, is about as general officers having full bird colonels as you're, you know, the, you're their reporting senior. And I think there is this common perception, and it's probably true, that, you know, when you're in 06 and you've, you've reached 06 command, you've done everything in your career correctly. Right? You just don't get 06 command if you're a marginal officer. That's, I, that's what my perspective is. And I think I'm probably right on that. So when you have 17 of them reporting to you, 
and they're already have proven themselves for 25 years is to be competent officers. What are some of the things that you start to see separate them as leaders that line some up for general officer consideration and some not? Yeah. The number one factor is what job you got. So I looked most of my guys in the eye and says, you're not going to be a general. So I, I started that with the base and station commanders when I, when I was Mickey East. Okay. Right. We don't like, Hey, the guy's got, you know, uh, new river. I like walk outside your office, walk down that hallway, look at all them pictures on the wall. Any of them generals? No, sir. And you ain't going to be the first. So fly those Eagles, right? You're in command. You're, you're, you're a station commander for three years. You're in command. Uh, it was what we cherish so much in the Marine Corps, but all commands aren't equal. Right. Right. The, you know, we're only picking two or three aviators a year and it's the guy that has mots and it's the guys had, has a group or a mute, right? For infantry guys, it's usually a mute commander, a, a regimental commander and CO TBS. Right, gets a lot, right? Just about, you know, four out of five CEOs of TBS make general. Okay. There's just certain commands and SOIs. You know, we've had, we've had like three since I've been in the Marine Corps 30 years that had SOI that made general, but most do not. That's just a fact. That's just statistics, right? And, you know, the, the CEO of Amphibious Assault School, we don't make Amphib generals. Right. You, know, you could go on and on through, through there. There's some. Like, yeah, see a comm school. He's got uh, Joe Broom. I, I, I think he should be a general, right? Because we pick, but we only pick one comm guy every, you know, three, four years. Right. Do they traditionally come out of the comm school? I mean, yeah, there had, there's been one. Okay. Uh, Nally is the only one that is on the wall that had comm school. Okay. So I think as a general officer, it's your duty to look these guys in the eye and, gal and tell them the truth. Right. Right. The likelihood. We make some generals out of OCS, CO of OCS, which also belongs to me, right? Right. You know, Dave Hyman's about as good as we got as a Marine Colonel, and I'd love to see him be a general in a few years. Joel Smith that just gave up the basic school. He, right. He should be a general. Where's he right. off to, by the way? He's Dave Finesse's uh, executive assistant. Okay. In the Pentagon. Yes. Yeah. EA. So you get picked for jobs like that. You know? So if it's logical that you have to hold the right jobs to... Be in consideration for general officer. Is it possible that you could de deconstruct that and say, okay, of, of the colonels who are in those high probability commands that don't get selected, what's happening there? It's just, just such a slim cut. It's just the, yeah, it's just the numbers. I, did, I, didn't get, I didn't get selected my first year. I got it my second. Look, it's just such a, a small group. You know, there's, there's three, maybe four ground Colonels each year, there's three aviators and there's, you know, one or two others. Right. And that other changes. Some years it's a comm, some years it's intel, some years it's a lawyer, you know, every right. four years, some years it's acquisition uh, general. So it's just a, such a, it's like lightning striking. It's, the, it's by far the toughest yeah. cut, right? Because out of those 10 that, that make, make brigadier, you know, eight or sometimes nine make major general. I'm going to shift gears a little bit because I want to talk about captains again. But and so here's my opinion. And if I'm wrong, we can just move on. But if you agree with me, I want to talk about this company grade officers and specifically I'm talking about captains, O3s. They seem to go through this struggle where they think they know everything. OK, and, and frankly, I was probably a little guilty of that, too. So I'm speaking from experience. But and they also worry about everything and they criticize everything except their own performance. And like I said, I was a little guilty of that when I was a captain too. So I think the true professionals are the early adopters of mastering their own authorities while also focusing inward on their individual proficiency and performance and, and less about all the things that they can't control. You know, and as an aside, these are probably the same individuals who can actually make the most difference to the men and women that they actually lead. So the question with that preamble is, do you have any advice for the young leaders that could help them overcome what I think is a pretty common tendency at that rank? Well, I tell, I have a saying that I say that I tell people, I'm like, Hey, your peers are more important than your boss and your peers of I mean, your Marines are more important than your peers. So your peers are more important than your boss and your Marines are more important than your peers, which means you focus down 
on your Marines. You focus down on leadership and you study your profession because you want to be the best. You, you want to understand warfare the best you can to take care of your Marines. So if you truly focus down and not up, which the higher up you go, the harder that is to do. Mm -hmm. But if you tell yourself that this is the last job I'm ever going to do, I'm going to treat it like the last job I'm ever going to do. It's easier said than done, but that's what you have to do. And you'll be successful. If you take care of your Marines, you care about them, you touch their souls, they will make you look, you, you really believe in that little white book. Uh, and the most important word in that little white book is trust. FMFM1 mm -hmm. is trust, right? And so that's, that's what I, I, I advise. i also tell you back to the last question. Hey, wearing those black britches ain't what it's all cracked up to be. And that's not the key to success. Well, okay, so, so what does that mean? Black britches, you know, when you become, when you become a general, you have to buy black britches, vice blues. So I'm just going to tell listeners, I don't know if they notice this or not, but when you become a general officer, your dress blue and your mess dress trousers change to a, a black from the blue. And, and I don't think people really recognize that that much. So that's what, that's what General Alford's referring to when he says puts on the black trousers. Riches. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm a little bit of a Yankee there, but you know. Um, but, but back to that question about the colonels, you know, I, I mean, like you said, if you make colonel command, you have risen to the top of the Marine Corps, right? You've made it to the top. The very, very few that make general is most of us luck. And, and the whole saying, you've heard, I've heard it a thousand times that you could, if a bus full of the this year's selectees run off a cliff, we could easily pick 10 more with no problem, right? And, and a good example is that, is that year that the list was thrown out by, by Secretary Mavis. That was the year after me, so that would so have been So tell, tell everybody what happened there. They, the, Just, the list was thrown out, and, and when the new list came out, they did, redid the board. Out of the 10 that were picked, four were different. Six were the same, four were different. The point of that is that it, four, it were four different than the original is. It was nine different generals on the board than the first board. You know, it couldn't be the same guys. They picked six of the same and four different. And I, I, that, that tells you right there that, you know, it, it's lightning striking when you're getting picking, right? And it's the dynamics of the boardroom. You mentioned that, you know, it's not all it's cracked up to be. So what are some of the shitty parts about being a general? Because I think people look at generals and they say, wow, that's awesome. I mean, I don't think anybody sees the shitty part. What are they? I mean, for me, for, for me is you lose touch with those Marines that you care, that made you who you are. And what I really cherished about being a Marine. And that's the young corporals and sergeants and lieutenants that you just don't get the chance to interact with like you did when you were a, a captain, major, lieutenant colonel, and even colonel. It's just, uh, and the... You know, there, there does, you know, when you step up into the general officer ranks, the political world gets infused into it that I, that I just that don't like that much either, right? It's just, it's not as fun for me as, as it was. I mean, I will never be able to replace 3-6 as a battalion commander. That was the pinnacle of my career, yeah. right? You know, platoon commander, company commander were both great, but nothing will ever replace that three and a half years that I, or uh, two and a half years that I had three six. Yeah, that's the takeaway, I think, sir. I'll just punctuate that because when you're in command, just live every single day of being in a command because every single one of us who's been an officer and at any level will say, my the best time of my life was, and then the insertion is never the recruit depot, AWS, AEWS. It's always command, 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 command. I think you're right. If you're if, sir, if you're listening to this and you're in command, just live every single day. And and I was like, I had a flag the entire time that I was a general. Eight years. Did you really? I didn't. I don't think I recognized that. ADC, you're you're a commander. You got you have an A. You okay. Know, I had the five separate battalions. That's right. So yeah. I had ta you know tanks, ABs, LEVs. Right. Two years at the warfighting lab. You're a commander. Okay. Down to base. You know, in charge of Mickey East. And then I went to Afghanistan for almost a year as CG of Task Force Southwest, and then back to the base. And then I've been in command here of training command. I've been in command the whole time. I've been lucky. Right. It, there's that, you know, there's that saying, break glass in case of war kind of Marine. I, they just never put the glass. They never got around to putting the glass around you. <laughs> yeah, I reckon. You're always out there uh, hooking and jab. And that's, that's awesome. Who, re who replaced you, sir, in your change of command? Farrell Sullivan. Oh, okay. Great. Good man. Yeah. Who I've been mentoring 
Uh, many years, right? So he was in Liberia with me. He was a power lifter. We, we lifted weights together there in the embassy, squat and deadlift, clean, you know, the real, real weight. Is he still power lifting in our age? Yeah, a little bit. We we all have gotten old and don't do as much as we used to. But he he lives two two doors down. So that's great. So uh, he'll be he'll be great. Yeah, he just got back from Bahrain. You know, he was he was the Marine General in Afghanistan right. during the evacuation. Mm-hmm. Well, congratulations to him on taking command, and that's a great lead into to a question that just came up in my mind. But you know, it, it, when you look out into the coming future, what do you see coming that our current talent, somebody like General Sullivan? What is it they should be weighing carefully? As you see what's coming in the future, what are some of the things that these leaders should be weighing very carefully? I, I think that we've made a little too much out of some of the technology that we talk about, right? Because when it, in real war, we're still going to need to be able to close and kill the enemy up close. It all is not going to be done long range, I do, I do not believe. Let me give you a story and an example. I was in Afghanistan 270 days as CG Task Force Southwest. So I was the strike officer. I had to make every strike. We killed 1,446 bad guys in 270 days. 1,446. So that was, we were killing bad guys every single day. But the brothers and the uncles and the cousins and the fathers and the sons of those that we killed were the same ones that took Kabul two years later because we didn't have a closing force. Right. The Afghan army would not close. Mm-hmm. And we didn't, have, we didn't have a force that took ground and put a bayonet in somebody's chest. And you still got to be able to do that to win war, I believe. So I think we, the leaders that are preparing for the future need to keep that in mind and need to study real war and prepare themselves. It all isn't going to be done with drones and long-range fires and, and this uh, lasers and stuff. Yeah. Right. This, we've talked about antiseptic war many times, and it never comes true. So I fear that, that we, we, got, we got leaders that think that we're going to be able to do it with all this whiz-bang stuff. We still got to be able to kill the enemy up close, right. particularly Marine Corps. Sage comments and, and advice, especially given the fact that we're at our essentially one-year anniversary of the Afghanistan evacuation. I think your words carry a lot of weight there. Quick question here. I, I've seen anecdotally, of course— a lot of the active duty Marine Corps, both enlisted and officers, getting out. And a lot of them seem to me to be going to join the National Guard or some other reserve component of one of our sister services. Can you think of anything that needs to be done to make the Marine Corps reserves as enticing as the National Guard or the other services reserve components? Because I think we're losing a lot of talent to opportunities away. We are. I think there's a couple of things with that. It's easier. There's, there's so many more National Guard units. So everybody's hometown has a National Guard, right, where the Marine Corps reserves you do not. Let's just say I'm an infantry guy and I want to be an infantry guy. I get out. I, I live in Atlanta, Georgia. Well, there's a, Montgomery, Alabama. There's a rifle company in Montgomery. So that's, what, four hours away. But that's it. Right. For infantry close to, to Atlanta. You know, the 20, all, most of the 25th Marines are up in the Northeast. So that one company is in Montgomery is a 323 company, if, I, if I'm right. Right. So that's one of it, right? It's just this, we don't have enough. We don't have the units in the right locations, I think, where our National Guards do. And you know that the Army Reserves is all their combat support. Correct. Service support. Correct. All their combat units are in the National Guard. We did that on purpose back in the 80s, where the American people would have to say yes to, to go to real war. Um, that's why that was done. But yeah, the, yeah, the National Guard would, I, I, I don't even know the numbers, but probably over 500,000. Know, but they're all combat arms units. Marines arms. I know personally have said, you know, I'm, I'm not going to re-enlist in the Marine Corps. I'm going to go to the National Guard and because they're sending me to airborne school and they're sending me to SF school and they get to do all the cool stuff that they wanted to do. And even if there is an infantry unit in their hometown, I think the the National Guard and those things still. Yeah, you have two. Yeah, the, the whole SF thing became cool to be right during the last 20 years. So you have two groups in the reserves, Army Reserves, the 20th group and um, what's the other one? Yeah, I don't know the numbers. I, I know there's two groups, there's, there's right? Two. Oh, yes. Sir. Interesting. Yeah. So, so as we wrap up here, because I, I, I will say that I appreciate you being passionate enough about talking about leadership to people that you took time out on a Sunday afternoon as you're getting ready to PCS tomorrow morning and 
want to keep this at an hour. So I'll wrap up with this last question, but what are some of the ways that you intend to satisfy your call to service during retirement? Yeah. Well, I've already, uh, MSTP, the great beer. That's an awesome idea. A little bit. Um, I wouldn't mind maybe doing that, get, give back to the Marine Corps, particularly if I could work it with the, you know, command staff and at that level, maybe go out for 29 Palms and mentor battalion commanders. There's an opportunity for that. Is that existing or are they thinking about standing that up? Yeah. Really? No, they have, they, there's a contract now that, the general favor does. he's the senior mentor for, for that. No kidding. That's what a great opportunity yeah. that is. Yeah. The joint staff is all, also uh, has has a mentoring a MSTP type uh, mentoring program that I'm, okay that I've been talked to about. So I'm on the board for the gun, the Marine Gunners Association. Okay, that's a nonprofit fr- fr- free board, right? So I've been told by all the retired generals, you want to pick one or two that you're passionate about of these boards that you know, that don't pay, right? That you're because you want to give back, and and I, and I've decided or was asked by the Marine Gunner Association to be on the board. And our first big meeting is uh, at the end of this month, back up here in D.C. Oh, that's great. You're going to love that. Yeah. They, yeah. So I don't know. I'll tell you this. I'm not going to get a job. Good for you. Right. I don't think I want to go to an office every day, bunch of clock type thing. Um, we'll see. I'm going to take a little time off. I'm going to go back and uh, work with my son, get to know him again a little bit. Right. He's got a roofing business. and. I think uh, I'll start being serious about getting some work in January. That's great. Well, on behalf of all the Marines I know, congratulations on a fantastic career, fantastic contribution to the, the finest fighting organization on the face of the earth. I don't know anybody who is celebrating that you're leaving. Everybody I know is extremely disappointed to to see you move on, but- it Comes time for all of us. I know, it's it's true. But it's exciting to hear that some of your ideas for continuing to satisfy your call for service are including staying involved in the Marine Corps, because I, for one, would, would love to see you still sticking around. So with that, sir, I just want to say thanks for the 36 years of your service. It's 36 years, right? 37. 37. Thank you for, for all of that hard work and, and the sacrifices that you and your family made to make sure that the Marine Corps has stayed the finest fighting organization on the face of the earth. And we wish you fair winds and following seas. And uh, sir, I, I hope this isn't the last time we talk and, and I look forward to catching up with you again in the future. So thanks again for your time. Yeah, it's good talking with you. Thank you. And Semper Fidelis. Semper Fi, sir. Right.